illumine our understanding that we might know the th wonderful things that are given to us of God. Amen. Although I am the very least of all the saints, says Paul, the great apostle, he says, I am the very least of all the saints. Is that our estimation of ourselves? Or do we think we are better than everybody else? Rather, the least? This grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles. That's why he was saved. To bring to the Gentiles. Wouldn't you call that the call of God? In fact, Paul said that God called him while he was yet in his mother's womb. As did, I think it was Jeremiah. And he says, to bring in the Gentiles, to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. Here we have the pearl and the reason for creation. That which has been formed with the Gentiles and with the Israelites. Because he is speaking after having said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20. Now, we better go back to verse 19. To the Ephesians, to the saints, and they would have been Gentiles and Israelites. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. And this specifically to the Gentiles, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, that to the Israelites, in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together, both Gentile and Israelite, the remnant, spiritually, into a dwelling place for God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The only dwelling place for God is this household of people. The only dwelling place for Christ is this household of people who have been saved by the grace of God and washed in the blood of the Lamb. There will never be a dwelling place on this earth either in Jerusalem or Palestine, a supposed restored Israel. He will never be there. That's not his dwelling place. He has a spiritual dwelling place, not a natural one. His spiritual dwelling place forever is in this household of God, consisting of saved Gentiles and saved Israelites. Praise the Lord. And then he says further down, and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages. This mystery was hidden throughout the whole of the Old Testament. You won't understand it by looking at the Old Testament. Do not go to the Old Testament to get your doctrines about salvation and Christ and the kingdom of God and the end time, you won't find it. Or about Israel, you won't find it. Because there is no end time for any natural Israel except what happened in the book of Revelation that already was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Because it says here, so that through the ecclesia, the called out ones, the wisdom of God 
in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The angels, the angels and rulers up there. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the eternal purpose of God that included the creation of this world, the creation of man, the creation of everything, both visible and in invisible, that is part of his creation, was purposed so that there might be this glorious pearl that is the called out ones according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are the pearl for which Jesus came and gave up everything. What, what was it that Jesus did lay aside? Jesus laid aside everything for a new creation, for a new creation, not A. So let's look at it. At the mystery of the ages, as being the called out ones, who we have determined is the pearl of great price. And for that pearl of great price, that is the called out ones of all nations and of all ages, for them the whole of creation was made. For uh, it is said in Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus was bringing many sons to glory. Another little verse that shows us the purposes of God. He did it to bring many sons to glory. So what happened? He has this purpose that shines in the darkness to show his power that we read about in Romans 9 to 11. He did this to show his power to Pharaoh. He has done this to show his power to the evil ones, both invisible and visible. To show his power is the major purpose, not the only purpose. So what happens? He creates the world. Satan falls and takes, a cup, takes his angels that obey him and not God. God creates the world. It becomes cursed because Adam falls into sin. Adam sins, Eve fell into sin. Terrible blight upon the human race. The angels, the fallen angels, intermarry with women and bring further evil into this world as created. All created. You've had a good creation. God created Adam and he, and he, said, he looked at everything. He said it was good. It was good. Jesus gave aside, put aside, that good creation. Because it says in, in Colossians, he created, God created everything through him. Jesus laid aside, because he is in the councils of God, the, the, the great God, the great I am and I am. He's in the councils of God, as we read about in the book of Proverbs, as the word of God, as the son of man promised, as the righteous one of one Enoch. He's in the councils of God. So he with his own decision to the Father, said, I will go. And he says that in Hebrews. He said, lo, I come. He's already said, I will go to the Father. He comes to earth. What is he laid aside throughout the whole of creation story? He laid aside a good creation because evil came in. And that had to do with his being creator also. He lays that aside. 
he lays aside having a humanity that is totally righteous to having a humanity that's totally evil. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He lays aside his worship from all the angels because Satan and his angels departed and the other angels that I believe were about 200 left their estate. They worshipped him. They were there to serve him. and They were there to serve God. They're his servants. He laid aside that. And then he has the promises to Abraham. Of course, God knows all this is going to happen and God plans it actually, according to even Ephesians chapter 1. He planned it. Nobody else did, according to the end of Romans 11. Nobody else planned it. Nobody counseled him. He did it all by himself. We can't understand it and never will. Maybe in eternity we might. Certainly not on this earth. The scriptures say so. We can't understand it. Then we look further. He lays aside the blessing, natural blessing that should have come to the natural people of Israel, but they refused and rebelled. He lays aside everything good that would have come out of the Old Testament for Israel, the natural Israel. It's all gone except for some, except for the remnant. Now, God has to put up with this over all the centuries. They became a stench in his nostril. Jesus laid aside enjoying the fruits and the blessings of the natural creation. He sold everything he had. Then in Philippians it tells us, being in the form of God and yet not considering that he had been an equal with God in his glory, he left heaven of his own will. He lost his glory, the manifestation of his glory on earth. It wasn't happening. Now he was there in glory that nobody could see. He didn't manifest his glory. He laid that aside. He laid aside his place in heaven. He laid it aside his place of glory. He laid it aside and stooped and humbled himself and became a man. Now that's a humbling because the creator becomes my saviour. The created. And he said this, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. He's the friend. He laid down his life for us, his friends. He called us his friends before we became his friends. We were already called friends in the New Testament. The elect, the called out ones. He called us friends. He laid down his life. He gave up his position in heaven. He gave up acting as God in heaven. Now he acted as God on earth, but he did not act uh, most of the time in the power of God and he did not act in the, with the glory of God. He mostly acted as a man. Then he humbled himself still further and he died on the cross. Then he humbled himself still further. His spirit left his body, his human spirit. He, as eternal spirit, went departed from his body, of course. And he, in his eternal spirit, descended to Hades and took out of Hades the remnant the elect, who had already died until that time, in, including any, Christ, any believers in him while he was on earth. Until that time, they would have gone to 
to paradise, as he said, Lazarus had done. So he took all of those. He humbled himself to go down there and do it, even though they were his own, they were still under the condemnation of death to such an extent that they, their bodies had corrupted and they're down there in their spirits. So he takes their spirits up to heaven without their bodies, of course. Now he had to descend to do that. And according to Nicodemus, the book of Nicodemus, he also descended to hell and came across the prince of hell and Satan. Now that also was a humbling and a throwing aside of himself as God to even go down there. He laid everything aside. So then, after his death, he, he's resurrected, he ascends to heaven. There he sits at the right hand of God in a position as being creator again. So from heaven, he creates. He has laid everything aside. Now he wants to find the pearl that of course he creates, because he's the creator. The pearl of great price. These called out ones. So from heaven, he begins his mission of creating this beautiful pearl that is the called out ones. It's the body of Christ. It's his creation. And he begins to recreate and create the spirits in their spirits. All those who are called out ones, whether Gentiles or the remnant of Israel. He begins this and he continues it and he is still doing it. I would say, and I say this, although I've never heard anybody else say it, but I will say it. The remnant of Israel have all come in. There's no other remnant of Israel to come in. He's got them all. They're in the pearl, up there in heaven, shining, living, praising. And many Gentiles are up there too. Part of the pearl. Part of the pearl are still down here. Some of us have already become the part of the pearl. There's still many more to come. And the pearl will begin to shine lustrously in heaven when we're all called home. And this is the purpose of God, to get this. He's given up everything. The purpose of Christ, who died, to redeem and buy this pearl back from the enemy. Because we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. And redeem means to purchase back. We were already in the hands of Satan he purchased us back. We were already in the clutches of sin. He purchased us back by his blood. He brought us back from the darkness in which we were and brought us into his eternal light. So here is the pearl for which the merchant sold everything he had to purchase it. And Christ sold everything he had to purchase us the pearl of great price. He's called out ones out of the remnant of Israel and out of all the Gentiles. Oh, glorious Lord. Oh, wonderful Saviour. Oh, mighty Redeemer. Great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We worship you and love you and adore you and bow at your feet and raise our eyes to look in your face and raise our hands to worship and bless you 
and use our feet and our tongues and our minds to tell others of the marvels of your grace and to do your bidding and to do your will because we are part of the pearl that has been bought with such a price and for us you came and for us you sought us and for us you died and for us so that we could be in that pearl part of the called out ones and we cannot thank you enough and words fail us but we praise you, O Lord Jesus. He laid aside his place in heaven. He laid it aside his place of glory. He laid it aside and stooped and humbled himself. 